All right, thank you everyone. While we have a few still coming in, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we wanted to first start uh, by just seeing where everyone is coming to us from today. So we have a map of the United States here on the screen. And if you head up to your controls, that should be near the top or bottom of your screen, there is a button that says annotate. And if you click on that, you can then click on something that says stamp. And you can choose an X, check mark, star, a heart. Go ahead and click on one of those and then give a stamp for where you are joining us from today. And if you accidentally put it out into the ocean, you can just click on it and drag it onto that state that you were looking for. All right, so I see a lot from Arizona. I'm seeing Rhode Island, Maryland. South Carolina, Wisconsin, all over. A lot in a lot in Minnesota, very nice. New York. Where do you find that button again to for the drop off to for the stamp? Yeah, so at the, it's either going to be at the top or the bottom of your screen, wherever the controls are. And it says annotate. It's a pencil icon, and when you click on that, then you'll get an. Uh, option for a stamp and you can click on whatever stamp you'd like. Wonderful, a lot of representation in Arizona like we always love to see, but all over the country. We'll do about 30 more seconds to get your stamp on there. California, South Carolina, Kentucky. I think I see a Washington and then moving to Arizona. Very nice. <laughs> All right, 10 more seconds to get your stamp on there. And then Nancy or Savannah, would you be able to take a screenshot so we can save this map? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Nancy, go ahead and take that screenshot, please. Got it. Okay, wonderful. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and clear and let's see here. Okay, great. So just as a reminder, uh, oh, I'm going backwards here. Okay, just as a reminder, please make sure you are muted so that our wonderful speakers can go ahead and share all of their wisdom with us today. Um, and if you'd like to, if you have a faculty member who is using this for participation, you'll want to make sure your name showing up on Zoom is your full name so that you can get that participation. All right, so we will go ahead and start with prayer. So if you would please join me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day and the chance to gather together and uplift the field of education. We thank you for bringing these speakers to us. You have a purpose for each of them. And today we get to learn from the amazing work that they've done. Please allow us to clear our minds from any assignments we have coming up, work we have to get done and any upcoming spring break plans. And of course to open our hearts and minds to learn from one another in this next hour together. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Okay, and uh, thank you. I see Savannah's already put up our poll, so you should have a poll just to share how did you hear about today's event. Thank you. Everyone. It's just the one poll. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Whoop, whoop, faculty and staff getting the word out. Yes, 90% from faculty and staff. We do have the best here at TCU. All 
All right. Oh, let me clear. We still have some annotations here on the screen. I'll go ahead and clear those. Uh, before we start, we do have five students who are recommended from faculty um, to ask the questions of our panel today. And I just wanted to give a big thank you to Riley, Krista, Carter, Whitney, and Natalie. Thank you so much for being the voice of your peers and asking our questions today. We appreciate you. Okay, so we will go ahead and first start with some speaker introductions. I'm sure you've seen our flyer, um, but if our speakers, we will just go ahead and go down the line. If you could just share your name um, and your current position within the field of education. So Dr. Diaz, could we start with you? Sure, and uh, hello everybody. Thank you so much for having me today. My name is Victor Diaz. I am the Director of Human Resources for the Phoenix Elementary School District. We are looking for great teachers in our community, and so I'll be sure to share my contact information at the end of the session. Thank you, Dr. Diaz. And Rahima? Good afternoon. I am Principal Rahima Stevens uh, at Sequoia Pathway Academy in the city of Maricopa. I'm with Ed Key Inc. Uh, we're a charter school district. And we're also looking for dynamic uh, teachers and educators as well. So I'm glad to be on the panel. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And Jerome. Good afternoon. I'm Jerome Garrison. Uh, excited to be here today. I currently work here at GCU. Uh, I work in the athletic department. Um, and so I work with student athlete development um, with our athletic teams. Um, we are not looking for teachers in our department right now, but we are producing teachers from GCU, so I'm just excited to be here today. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Nyoka. Hi, I'm Nyoka Freeman, and I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I am the STEAM in PLTW, which is Project Lead the Way Coordinator for Helix Community Schools, which is a charter school here in Baton Rouge. Um, I also teach science and I'm an instructional specialist. Great, thank you very much. We're so excited to have you all here today. Of course, our theme of you've seen on our flyers is teach then what? So we have an amazing panel of individuals who started in the classroom as uh, teachers of record and then have moved on to different careers within the field of education. So we're very excited to just see how the future is bright for all of our students who are in the classroom and what their futures could look like as well today. So I'm going to go ahead and get us started with our first question, which is, tell us more about your experiences as an educator. What made you want to be a teacher and what are you doing now? And we will go ahead and start with Nayoka. Oh, great. So um, my experiences as an educator, I am now in my 28th year of teaching or in the educational field. I can't lie, I've had nothing but good times and good experiences with the people I've been with. I have yet to be at a really bad school, so I think I'm just blessed that way right now. <laughs> um, I did not start out wanting to be a teacher, so it was pediatrics all the way through, and then uh, um, things changed in my family dynamic, which sent me into teaching. Both of my parents are teachers, uh, siblings are teachers, so here I am a teacher, and um, right now I am still partial classroom and partial instructional coach, and that's what I'm doing now. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Jerome, would you share next? Yes, I'll go ahead. Um, so my experiences as an educator, uh, I... When I finished here at Grand Canyon, I played basketball here at Grand Canyon. Um, and after my four years here, I was able to play overseas. I was blessed to get a chance to play overseas and play professionally. Um, that career was cut really short. Um, I had a health situation in the family. Um, and so that's that's why I retired. I retired from my family uh, to be able to return home here to Arizona, take care of them and, and be with them. And the greatest decision of my life. And so. Um, after doing that, after about playing for about a year and a half professionally, um, I came back and, and got right involved in teaching um, at a charter school in Avondale. Um, I was the teacher, I was the uh, PE teacher, and I was the athletic director. 
uh, at the campus and uh, truly enjoyed my time there. Um, after that, that was a K through eight. After that, um, I had the opportunity to uh, move on and, and become an athletic director at the high school level. Um, and so I did that for the last three years. Um, I was at another local charter school in Arizona, um, in Glendale, um, truly enjoyed that time. Uh, and then now I am working here at GCU, um, working with collegiate athletes. And so I've actually had the K through 12 and then now uh, 13 plus experience um, working with almost every level of education. So uh, not a, currently a teacher right now, but I uh, have a lot of duties that are like a teacher um, in the sense where I'm helping the student athletes make sure that they're eligible and that they're out there competing. Thank you very much. Rahima, could you share? Absolutely. I think I'm across between Nyoka and Jerome in my kind of <laughs> path. <laughs> Um, I grew up in a household of teachers, both my parents were educators, and I vowed I would never go into education. <laughs> and listen, um, I can't even tell you how I got here other than <laughs> after my playing career, I also played collegiately at UCLA, uh, was full scholarship athlete. I went overseas for a number of years and played uh, in Greece and in Australia and a number of other places, as well as the ABL and the WNBA. When all of that ended, I had no idea what I wanted to do with the rest of my life, but all I knew was I loved being around young people and I had a lot to offer and to give as far as knowledge. I traveled the world, I had a college degree, uh, and I kind of attracted young people, athletes initially, I coached, and then, you know, it just kind of, I don't know, get destined, birthed into this education career, um, became a classroom teacher and the rest was history. Um, and each stage of my career, I found myself um, wanting to be a specialist, um, a classroom teacher, I was PE, I taught math, I coached. And then um, I realized that I could support teachers and became a school counselor and earned my master's uh, in school counseling. Spent a number of years assisting teachers and parents and students become the best that they can be. Uh, and then I realized that God called me to coach and teach teachers. Um, and so here I am today, a principal, uh, still super excited like I was day one. Um, and um, yeah, I hope to keep going and continue. Thank you. And Dr. Diaz, could you finish us up? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's really cool to get to answer this question last because you get to really see how many different walks of life leads one to being a teacher. And so uh, for me, my experience as an educator really rooted my experiences as a youngster, as, as a student. Um, I'm the first person in my family that graduated from college. And um, with that being said, I know firsthand the barriers that exist for, for trailblazers in their own family, but I also know the power of education what that means for the individual, what that means for what I could do for my family. And as a teacher, if you do it enough times, what you could do for an entire community. Uh, and so that is one place where just my experience as an educator rooted. The other is through coaching and through athletics. So I think it's awesome. we got some athletes here. Uh, if you want to meet some really great coaches, meet some college basketball, I mean, meet great teachers, meet some college basketball coaches that know it's about running programs, not winning games. And that's a big distinction in, in, in coaching basketball. That's the kind of mindset I tried to take as a teacher, that it wasn't just about having a great lesson or a great year. What kind of program am I developing here? And so when I think about that, what, what really made me be an educator um, as a teacher was thinking about things like creating spaces for students, hustling resources together for students so that they could start to actualize their future possible selves, so they could self-author their own futures, and that I could somehow be a part of that, not because I'm holding the pen and authoring it, but because I'm creating the conditions for them to actualize their full, just humanity. <laughs> and so when I think about teachers, I think it's always amazing that, that it, to, to teach, it, it's both a verb and a noun. Um, and the really good teachers don't distinguish between the two. It's a state of being, it's a state of consciousness, it's a state of humanity. And that's been in me for a very long time now. I'm in my 21st year in public education. Um, and it, I've had a very windy road that I'll get into later in terms of different business cards that I've had. But at the end of the day, it all comes back down to a very uh, distinct mission, which is that we are, we're here to lift others 
Um, I am here to be a servant for others. And what better way to do that than to have the fingerprints on somebody who's going to do great things in the world and to have that kind of mindset about all the students that I worked with when I was a teacher. Um, and now all the students I, I more indirectly work with now that I'm hiring teachers and, and making sure that our community has great teachers. Thank you very much. I can hear the passion already in all of you and all you have to share. So we'll head into our first question from our students. Let's see. I think my PowerPoint is frozen. So Riley, if you could go ahead and just ask your question and I'll get the PowerPoint going. Yeah, of course. This question is for all the panelists. What role do you currently have in the field of education and what led you to that current role? And if we could start uh, with Jerome this time. Okay, yeah, so <clears throat> as I stated before, I'm currently uh, a student athlete development coordinator uh, here at Grand Canyon University. And so what that looks like um, is I basically, I do a lot <laughs> with that job. And I know that there are some questions to come later uh, that may help bring more light to that. Um, so I can dive into that a little bit later. But what led me uh, into this current role was my experiences that I've already had in education. I'm working with K through 12. Um, I learned a lot about myself. I'm sure like the other educators on this call that can relate. Um, education is a, it's a, it's a mutual journey. Um, as much as I'm educating the students, they're teaching me a lot about myself. And so in that journey for me so far in my life, I learned that I worked really, really well uh, with older students. Um, I was great with the kindergartners, trust me, when I get them going in PE, uh, it was the best times of my life. I used to love just getting them to the gym, just getting them there uh, was a journey. But once they got there, I absolutely loved it. Um, but you learn a lot about yourself. And so I learned that I had an ability to speak life into older students. Um, and I really had a passion for making sure that they get their college degrees uh, while playing. Um, as a former student athlete, um, I can't tell you how many different stories I have uh, guys that I played with or guys that I know, um, male and female, that uh, struggled finishing school um, and struggled because they got their degree and had a plan for their life after they were done playing. Um, as much as it seems like they have it all together, they don't all the time. And so um, I really feel like that's what the Lord put on my heart to do is to is to come back um, in that setting. And I just happen to be blessed with the opportunity here at Grand Canyon University, uh, the same place that I got an undergrad degree. Um, and I just felt like that was that was an absolute opp amazing opportunity for me. Um, so that's how I ended up here. Um, I absolutely love my journey to this point. I share my story all the time with the student athletes because it's very real. Um, and, and I share every part of it because I think that they need to understand that the whole journey uh, isn't always just butterflies. It's not always a beautiful thing. As much as it's amazing to be interviewed after a game and be on TV and, and have all the fame and all that, there's also a whole other side to this thing. And so um, I speak life into those students every day doing that. And I'm just blessed to be able to do that with 400 student athletes here now. Um, and make sure that they have a full plan for their life um, so that they can be on this call one day, right? Give it back uh, to somebody else. And so that's really my full uh, intention um, and that's my plan. Thank you, Jerome. We'll go ahead and pass it on over to Nayoka. So the role that I currently hold right now is several roles. I'm at a... Um, a small charter school right now so it's a lot of different titles <laughs> but it's not as much as if I had been at a huge public school so I'm kind of happy in that aspect um I am the instructional specialist for our high school I teach middle school science and I um do STEAM and PLTW coordination for all three of our schools. What got me into um, this particular role, when I say stepping out on faith, <laughs> that's, I stepped out of my comfort zone. I love teaching. I love being with my students. I love encouraging them. And I tend to have that same effect with everybody that I talk to. And so our CEO at the time was like, hey, I want you to do this. 
And I stepped out on faith and that's how I got there. Thank you, Nayoka. Brahima, could you share? Absolutely. Um, my current role is I am a secondary um, school principal um, covering seventh grade at a charter school, seventh grade through 12th grade. Um, and my journey is interesting because I just graduated last April from GCU with my um, master's in uh, school administration. Um, and because I've, I've kind of created a network and a community of people and um, just been blessed. Um, I was recommended for my job this year. So somebody talked to somebody else and somebody said, hey, come on over here. And I really just believe the timing of God, when, when God has his hand on your life and uh, he wants to put you somewhere, I tell you, he can make it happen. I was all set to go back to my previous school as a school counselor for my third, fourth year and got a call. And so I accepted that call. And I really do believe education is a calling. Um, I believe um, that when you get into this field, uh, you are in a service field. So you're serving others. And um, as a previous teacher, as a previous counselor, um, I really believe um, kind of mixing those, um, those skill sets um, and my passion for helping people become the best selves. I've been very privileged in uh, being able to go to school on a full ride scholarship to UCLA. Uh, I've been all around the world playing basketball. I've been to Olympic Training Center. I've met people um, that I would have never met before because of the, the sport of basketball. Um, and so now I have this honor and privilege to take, put all that together, um, draw people from all walks of life. And we are here changing lives, um, meeting kids right where they are, and uh, helping them see the best of themselves. I come from the inner city Oakland and I don't come from anything special, but both my parents believed in me and spoke into me. And I'm just doing for the children that I serve what my parents and mentors did for me. And so there are no limits, there are no boundaries. There's nothing you can't do. Uh, I know that in my own life and I speak that to children. So if you are passionate about helping others achieve their best selves. Um, right. First, you got to become your best self and continue to do that as a lifelong learner. Um, and then um, just keep being authentically you uh, with young people. So as a principal, I show up every day and have the same fun I did in the classroom. Um, same fun I had when I used to play basketball. It's all good times and I enjoy every minute of it. And I think what people can see when you love what you do because it it shows. So that's how I got where I am right now. Thank you, Rahima. I see in the chat, you're making some of us cry. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Diaz, go ahead. <laughs> see if you can make us cry too. <laughs> well, I might do that in a different way because um, I, I agree with everything all the panelists have said. And this is a really cool panel to be a part of, but I, I, I will share maybe like a more grittier sort of path because teaching is also incredibly hard. To me, teaching is an act of love and not this Disney sort of love where like your prince or princess is gonna come someday and happily ever after. I mean, love like I've had 30 bad days, but I had 31 good days. So I'm gonna sign up for day 62. Um, and especially your first year in teaching, your first year as a principal. My dad told me once the first six months of any job is hard, even if it's your dream job. Um, and so I, I think of the different steps that I've been, I've seen that to be true. And so the role I currently have is very difficult. I'm the director of human resources for Arizona's first public school district. Uh, we just celebrated our 150th anniversary, uh, birthday, I should say, uh, here in Phoenix Elementary School District. And so with 150 years comes a great responsibility to uphold the legacy of all those that came before me. I mean, the revolutionary idea that we ought to educate everybody for free up into a certain age started like where I'm sitting right now. <laughs> um, and so it's incredibly challenging, though, because I do a lot of things to balance a lot of interests and to get folks to really have strong relationships with each other. I always think what's best for kids is that you have a caring group of adults uh, around them and with them um, through, their, through their journey. So in terms of what led me to this role, um, I, I definitely shared earlier, you know, like I, I started as a teacher. I was a high school English teacher in San Jose, California, a lot of love to the Bay Area. 
Um, and then I, um, I got my master's degree in San Francisco State in educational equity and social justice. And that opened a whole new set of doors to me to leadership type roles. So I became a, a curriculum coach and an academic coach. I started training teachers. I became a teacher educator. I've taught at GCU. I've taught at ASU. I've taught in some other places as well. Uh, eventually, that led me to get my, my PhD in education leadership from Arizona State, and that's now led me to um, district administration. Uh, for me, HR was kind of an accident. <laughs> um, I was voluntold to join the HR department in my previous district at a time of intense need, uh, as the district was, was um, turning over some staff and just needed some support. And what started is, you know, for a few months, can you please go to HR and help them out with student teachers and substitute teachers? has now turned to eight years in human resources um, and everything that I, that I get to do here. And I think what's awesome about my sort of journey, and I think a lot of the journeys you can hear here, um, your business cards are going to change. Your job titles are going to change, but your mission only gets stronger with time. Um, and you need to have that because the, the wind can get really shaky as you start to progress down these, whether they're leaps of faith or steps of faith um, or, or, um, or different career paths. Uh, and, and so I, I think it's awesome that each of the panelists you're kind of sharing, what is that thing that really roots you that you can go back to in times of reflection, in times of introspection, and really in times of difficulties? Because at the end of the day, I, I, was a, I was a classroom teacher for eight years. I've now done this job for eight years. Uh, it hasn't been all sunshine and roses every day, but it has for at least one more hour than it hasn't. And so I'm going to keep doing it <laughs> uh, because because that's what we do. Um, and I think too often we just get these narratives of, of, of teachers. Again, it's like Miss Honey from Matilda. No, <laughs> um, it's greedier than that. It's harder than that. It's more, it's more real than that. Uh, and I think that's what really sustains me now in this role. Thank you so much. All right, I'm gonna hand it on over to Krista for our next question. Uh, this question is for Jerome. What was your first year like working in a school? What were some of the barriers you overcame during this time that our current College of Education students heading into classroom and schools can learn from? Yeah, no, this is a great question. Um, there were a lot of barriers in my first year of education. Uh, the number one barrier was a personal battle I had to go through, which was I was coming from playing professional sports where everything was handed to me on a platter. And uh, education, you know, you, you join a school and you're in the crosswalk all of a sudden and you're helping at PE at recess and you know after school and everything and so uh, for the first month or so it was just this reality check for me to, to really realize that I'm in a place where I'm going to serve I'm not here to be served I'm going to serve and um, that was the greatest thing that could happen to me in my life um, like I told you like I shared with you with my personal journey um, someone was really sick in my family at the time um, and so I was already really in a vulnerable state where I needed the students as much as they needed me um, because I needed encouragement. I was really struggling with my mom. She was really sick um, and I thought I was going to lose her. And so uh, my first barrier was getting over myself. Um, and I'm not sure, sure, actually I'm sure other educators on this call can, can attest to that. You change um, and something happens to you when you get an education. And so that was my first barrier. But um, really some of the best the advice I can give with this question is, it's really broken down into three things. Um, the number one thing I would say is maintain your health. Um, you know, when you teach, when you work in schools, especially the public school education, um, you give a lot. You give a lot of your time. You give a lot of your talents. You give a lot of your energy. And you forget to eat. You, know, you look up and it's 7 p.m. and you yeah. haven't had anything to eat the whole day. And so uh, the number one thing would be maintain your health. Uh, take care of yourself uh, at some point. And you'll hear someone wherever you end up getting a job, they'll tell you that too. Maintain your health. And the second thing would be uh, maintain your communication with all of your mentors um, and the people that have supported you in your life. I'm on this call right now because of the amazing people here at GCU. I can go on and on. A lot of them are on this call actually right now. I was looking at some of the names a second ago. I was like, man, this person and that person and that person. And I see them some days just walking around here on campus and it's special for me uh, because the same people. Um, that help you uh, either get your undergrad degree or encourage you to go to school are going to be the same people that are going to be with you um, as you're continuing your journey down the road. And so I'm really thankful for my mentors. I'm really thankful for the professors that I had here in my time um, because I still reached out to them when I was a teacher. I needed help. I needed support. I needed to learn um, what ways I could get better as a teacher. 
Um, and I got really heavily involved uh, with the university while I was a teacher. And so I wanted to make sure that I was developing in those ways. And then the third thing that I leave you with is bring uh, your relevant knowledge. Um, as, a, as a student that uh, potentially graduates soon here or has plans to graduate and go into the classrooms, you're going to have new knowledge that's going to be very relevant to the state of education at this point. Um, one example would be COVID. COVID changed how we educate students now. And so uh, we all have to learn. We have veteran teachers and then we have new teachers and you bring something that's very important. And so some of those barriers that I have faced, I really, um, I really dominated them, I'd say, by those three ways. Because I was able to maintain my health, I was able to maintain those relationships with mentors, and then I really wanted to bring my innovation. I didn't want to just accept the way things were. I thought it was really important to make sure that I could give something even more, uh, that I could give something special to the students that they had never experienced before. And so that's what each and every one of us has, is a special calling, and until you bring it, um, it's not going to be experienced. And so those would be my three things that I'd say I, I kind of use to overcome the barriers. Thank you very much, Jerome. All right, we'll pass it on over to Carter for our next question. Hi, this question is for Rahima. Um, so you're a principal and we're wondering what made you want to serve as a leader in secondary education? Um, I think uh, over the years, I think I've been in education over 20 years and being in the classroom has its its perks and and being up close and personal with students is fantastic. And then I was able to move on to being a counselor, a school counselor. So now I'm outside the classroom, but I understand the classroom dynamic um, and I can assist teachers, um, students one-on-one uh, -on -one in groups, as well as parents in helping a student become the most successful they can be. Um, and then, being a counselor, and I work directly with administrators, I have for a number of years, watching and listening and seeing the impact that they have. Um, I'm from inner city Oakland. I heard Bay Area on the call, so that's wonderful. Um, and so I grew up uh, in, in the inner city and um, representing as an African-American uh, in higher education is huge for me, the representation for our kids, we have a very diverse student population at my school. And I think having um, the courage to say, all right, I'd love to be able to step into that role um, as, a, as an administrator, making decisions, helping teachers be, become um, the best version of themselves, encouraging them, um, the coach in me, um, but also being able to stand on campus and kids see, you know what, see what to be. I think sometimes we're where we are so kids can see what to be. And so for me, it means a lot when I have young women and young men, you know, see me in a position um, where I'm helping them, I'm helping teachers, I'm encouraging and motivating the entire campus, um, which is not easy. Um, but I believe the counselor in me, my heart, um, and the teacher in me, my head, together, um, I'm able to do both. Um, and obviously being led by the Lord, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's a tough job. Um, but again, I think I'm the biggest ser servant of all on campus. I lead in service uh, every day. It's not about me. I put them first, my teachers, my students, parents. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, every day it's, you learn something new about yourself. You learn something new about your campus. You learn something new about your teachers and kids. Um, and that's what makes the journey so wonderful is every day is different. Um, every day you learn something, you never stop learning. Even at this level, I have lots to learn. Um, students teach me, parents teach me. My teachers lead uh, the way many days, I'm, many days I concede to my teachers who are the experts. And so, um, yeah, no, this is a great position to be in, a great role. If someone aspires to be a principal, um, you, are, you are literally the leader in service on, on your campus. So um, I, am, I put them up before me. I'm at the bottom and I'm, I literally am holding them up every single day. So, yeah, I hope that answers your question, Carter. 
Absolutely. I love that. Uh, certain le servant leadership. That's great. I love to hear that. We have a follow-up question for that one. Um, and it was when you decided you wanted to be a principal, what were the steps you started to get your degree and certification for it? Yeah. So, you know, it was funny when you're in education, you always have schools come through, you know, wanting to share what they offer in their, um, their master's programs or their PhD programs. And so it was super simple, you know, and they provide lunch. I don't know if you know, these, these schools come through and they go, Hey, we've got lunch for you in the break room. And that's how it all started. I went for the free lunch Carter. I'm going to be honest. Uh, I was super satisfied in my position and role and I went for the free lunch and I met this amazing um, counselor who came, this representative of GCU who came and talked to me about what my future looked like in education. Um, and I saw myself after a few minutes talking with this individual and eating this free lunch that there is, there are, there's a world of possibilities. Uh, in education. Um, and so that's how it started. It started with a conversation of where do you see yourself in the next three years? Um, and then it went, you know, it went from there. Um, I signed up, be, you know, immediately. Um, and I think you have to kind of make those decisions in the moment, like when you notice that, you know, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And um, just started the the education process, went back to school. This is my third master's uh, degree. And, um, and so um, here we go, lifelong learner, back in the classroom. Um, so yeah, and then uh, obviously I just finished my master's in administration and was offered a position as a, as a, count, as a principal, excuse me. And uh, I finished and passed subtest one of the principal's exam. And I take my second exam soon. So I will be certified here probably before the end of the school year. So it's a process, it's a journey, um, and it's been, it's been exciting. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Whitney, you have our next question. Yes, my question is for Jerome. So you're a student athlete development coordinator. Tell us what you do in this role and how it's similar and different to your previous role in K-12 schools. Yeah, um, following my uh, my own five P's uh, uh, <laughs> poor performance pre or sorry, oh man, proper preparation prevents poor performance. I'm I'm struggling myself. It's a long day. Um, I wanted to write this down before the call. I was like, what if I get the question on what do I do? How do I describe that? Because every time someone asks me, um, they wonder like, what do you do as student athlete development? What does that all encompass, and how does it relate to teaching? Um, pretty much every way. Um, so I wrote down some things that would help make this clear. So everything from initial eligibility. Um, so when we get a high school student athlete that's interested in coming, uh, for example, here at GCU or any university, um, there is a student athlete academic coordinator that helps make sure that that, uh, that athlete's going to be eligible. Um, so this is why when you're working in the public school system, it is so important to be driving home education um, because they can't even get the opportunity to play unless they're eligible. And so we do initial eligibility, we do transfers. So right now, um, typically on ESPN or something, you're hearing about the transfer portal. And so we do work with student athletes that are trying to leave a university and go somewhere else uh, to chase the ring, chase the title, chase all that. Um, but we have to make sure that they're gonna be able to get into the university. And so we work with them in that regard, um, maintaining um, academic excellence um, with our teams. Uh, here at GCU, for example, we want our student athletes to be really good student athletes. That's exactly what we want them to be. And so you have to challenge them. You have to teach them skills on advocating for themselves, time management. Um, like I said before, maintaining their own health, nutrition. You have to teach these all, teaching them all these things. And so I meet with student athletes one on one uh, to go over these different skill sets. Um, also, working with students that have ADHD and autism. Um, not every single student that comes into uh, the collegiate level to play sports uh, doesn't have an IEP behind their name. Um, and so there's someone that's got to have that experience, have that knowledge. Um, and so my experience in the public school system actually taught me and gave me the experience needed to understand um, what's needed to set those certain accommodations um, that are needed for student athletes here in their time. Um, and then helping them just with uh, planning, um, 
their careers after they're done. Um, and so we help them get their degrees right, by showing them the course walks and making sure they understand everything that's going to come in their way in the four years, but also making sure that they are starting to plan their life after, after sports um, in terms of getting them opportunities in front of uh, other career fields. Um, we do a lot of um, different uh, different uh, events where uh, we'll bring in companies to speak to the student athletes and we'll talk about uh, finances, we'll talk about uh, relationships, we'll talk about a lot of different things that they're developing these skills all while spending countless hours in the sport that they are working at. And so um, it's a very busy job. Um, so it's very much like teaching uh, in that regard. But, uh, comes with a lot of uh, new new things to it in that sense, um, and I love it. Absolutely love it. Thank you very much, Jerome. And Natalie has our next question. So this next question is for Nyoka. Nyoka, you told us a little bit how you are an instructional coach. Would you please tell us a little more about this role? Thank you for that question, Natalie. So as an instructional coach, um, my role is to work closely with the teachers in the schools and develop different lessons and find ways to differentiate the learning so that all students can be reached. I am a mentor, a role model. Um, I keep teachers up to date on techniques, different technology that comes up and any new school initiatives that are passed during the year. Um, I also work intensely with um, first year and new to the industry teachers to develop an effective teaching style for that teacher so that they can go into their rooms and flourish in their, um, in their actual subject area. And I assist with curriculum and data collection and analysis I work closely underneath our data specialists and help our teachers to um, use the data that they get from their classes to further the students' learning. Um, I also work with our teachers to, um, to get them to do things that they may not feel they are prepared to do. If that makes sense, um, a lot of them are very apprehensive. Either they weren't in the edu in education in college, or they're coming out of the business career, and they just jump headfirst into education. So it's my job as an instructional specialist to make sure they're as prepared as they can be to get into that classroom and actually educate our students. Perfect, and I have a follow-up question for you, Nayoka. In your work as an instructional coach, what are areas that you see first-year teachers struggle with the most? And what can our students do during their programs and in these first years to prepare for these areas or in these areas? That's an excellent question. <laughs> so um, with the areas that I see most of our first-year teachers struggle, time management, is a huge area. There is gobs and gobs and gobs of paperwork. I'm not even going to lie to you. There are so many papers on my desk right now, and you have to figure out how am I going to manage doing paper, a home life, um, whatever else I have going on, different sponsorships, whatever. You have to manage all of those things. So time management off of the top would be the first struggle that I see most of the teachers go with. Um, also, their teaching styles. A lot of teachers come in and they don't know what their teaching style is. They've seen their other teachers do it and they try to mimic those. But if I'm a very low-key teacher, you know, Louisiana is very easygoing, I can't just go in class and go, blah, 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 blah. No, I have to go in and be myself and my students kind of follow suit. So you have to find out what your particular teaching style is. Um, to actually prepare for your first year, the very first thing I would say is to get a mentor teacher. I think um, Jerome said that. 
get a mentor teacher as soon as you get to your school. I would, if you have summer um, workshops that you do with the other teachers, start looking. Ask, find out who is great in class, who has the best time with the students, whose teaching is phenomenal. Get with that teacher and go look at their classes. Go observe. You're not always going to have the same prep periods. You're um, going to be off. Go sit in their room. Go eat lunch with them. Talk to them. That's one of the best things that you can do your first year. Um, also, like I said, figure out what teaching style works best for you. What are some of your negotiables and non-negotiables? We always go through what am I going to deal with in class and what can I not deal with in class? And it's not always the same for every teacher. And then um, last thing I would say is jump head first into everything at the school, see what you like, see what you do really, really well with. Um, I'm in science. Our, our students started, they wanted robotics. Ms. Freeman, will you? Yes, let's see what we can do. And robotics got me the STEM coordinator because I just said, hey, let's try it. They went forth with it and we had a great time. Also talking to other teachers helped sitting down with them, hey guys, how can we make this better for our um, students? What's some student needs that you see in your class and I see in my class? And that got me into instructional coaching. And truly instructional coaching is a dream job working with other teachers because you affect a lot more students than you realize you do. But you have to just kind of get in there and do what you do be helpful, um, be a servant, and things work out. I hope that answers that. <laughs> yeah, that was very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. And we have our next question from Krista. This question is for Dr. Diaz. You serve as a director of human resources, which is probably a career most of our GCU students haven't considered before. Tell us more about this role. Oh, thanks, Krista. Yeah, I mean, when I first decided, you know, maybe human resources was interesting, I think my greatest schema came from the office and the role of Toby um, and, and not many more than that. HR was the place I thought where you go when you get in trouble. Um, and the less they call you, the better. And so I definitely reproach this role from that perspective in trying to reshape this as actually a place that is here to do the very same things I did for my students when I was their teacher. Find resources, build space for you to live your best life, be your best self with our students, knowing that that's going to raise uh, everybody to a new level. You as a professional, our students as scholars, our families as people that are committed to, to their kids and our community as a whole. Um, and so in my role, uh, very specifically, there are about four big rocks that I have. Uh, the first is I lead a human resources department of eight amazing professionals. Um, and we are with our staff every step of their journey while they're in Phoenix Elementary, from the first time that they hear the pitch that we're hiring great teachers to our community, to hopefully the day years and years and years later, where they're seeing the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and it's time for them to retire, and every day in between. Uh, another big rock that I lead is the enforcement of board policies. And so, yeah, when people get in trouble, they do come to Human Resources. It's my job to make sure that we are operating an ethical, safe place for all people. Um, and that we enforce board policies at the times that we need to. Um, I do that from a very PBIS influence lens for those folks that are literate with that in schools. I follow those same steps with employees. I definitely assume we're all better than our worst mistakes. I definitely assume that all behavior is learned behavior. And you have maybe learned a bad behavior by clocking in late or using foul language with a colleague when you're frustrated. Well, you can learn good behavior too in terms of being a good professional. Um, Another uh, rock that I have is I lead all of our human capital and organization development systems. So all of our hiring processes, our recruiting processes, um, how we work with undergraduate students at GCU to be substitute teachers, paid student teacher options uh, as well. Um, I get to innovate a lot in that area. I'm really excited at Phoenix Elementary. We have found one way to work with GCU students who are doing dual certifications in special education, general education to satisfy those requirements while being a paid student teacher. 
something I know that was quite a barrier for a lot of students up until this school year. Um, and, and not just for teachers, bus drivers, crossing guards, principals. Today, we were interviewing principal candidates at Lowell Elementary School. Um, and so it's really exciting to get to do that work of, of, of hiring and building teams. All great things were not uh, developed by individuals. They're developed by teams that have time, that have resources. Uh, and so we get to do all that. Uh, and then the last really big bucket for me is developing a lot of partnerships for our district. We're all stronger together. Partnerships with places like GCU, uh, the Arizona Department of Education, uh, a whole bunch of other places where I get to be that point of contact of, um, as an innovator, again, just really getting to connect things together that are going to make better things for, for our community. Um, I do that all through the same lens I brought as a teacher. I try to do that very empathetically. I try to do that with a, with a heart of compassion, with some authenticity, with some humility. Um, and while we're also striving for opportunity for inclusion, uh, for broader participation and economic and democratic processes. Uh, and so it's a really cool role because, I, again, I get to do a lot of those things. I first did as a youth basketball coach. I then did as like the summer camp counselor, then as a teacher. And now I get to do that for this entire community of leaders and learners. That's awesome. Thank you. There's a follow up question for you as well. Ah, what was your journey from the classroom to director of human resources like? What called you to leave the classroom and move into this new area? It was windy. Um, I've 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 done a lot of different things. I've been a governing board member. I've been a curriculum coach, like I said before. I've been an academic coach. Um, I've done a lot of things. I, I I've never been a principal, and my hat's always after principals. They do the hardest job in America. <laughs> Uh, not just in education. There's no job that requires you to know that much stuff about that many things. Um, and so hats off to our principals. Um, in terms of this, you know, what, like what called me to leave the classroom, I, I, I feel like I, I, I wasn't called to necessarily leave the classroom. Um, I, there's just these serendipitous opportunities that, if you know, listening to what our, our other speakers have said, when you listen to your mentors, when you open your heart to opportunities, when you open your mind to new learning, it's just amazing. Um, I, I never in my career have I said I wanted to be an X, and so I'm going to follow that road to become an X. It's just been, hey, do you have a minute for coffee? Sure. Next thing I know, I got this great thing that opened up in my life. It's the same sort of thing for me and like how I met my wife, <laughs> um, the very serendipitous way that uh, our children have come into the world. Um, I've just been very fortunate, very blessed to live a life, I think, where a lot of these things do open themselves up. And where I've been encouraged by my mentors um, and by my past experience of sort of blazing trails to, to not be afraid when an opportunity to, to make a broader impact uh, comes along. I think as a school administrator, I think for all district and school administrators, it's also important to still have yourself rooted in classrooms. I definitely tell teachers, if you ever think I forget how hard your job is, call me up and I'll sub for you. Like, seriously, I'll come for an hour. I'll come for half a day. If you think I need some humility and some humbling, come humble me call on me. I'll come to you. <laughs> um, because I, I think as leaders, we need to still have that sort of that same servant heart that we had as teachers. Um, I think our classroom just broadens. Uh, we tear down the walls of the four uh, walls of the classroom. We tear down the six periods of the school day. Um, and that opportunity to make an impact, it, it just broadens, I think, when you then become an administrator. And I think that's why so many administrators, when they retire, they go back into becoming teachers. <laughs> Um, because it, it just creates this very full circle moment of the ways in which your, your, your service, your mission have led you to so many different places, but ultimately right back to that moment with that child, with those light bulb moments, those, those, those amazing moments where uh, you're doing something that might look really insignificant at the moment, but years and years later, it just grows and grows. The other day, um, a former student of mine uh, shared with me a Christmas card I wrote her in 2004 where in this Christmas card, I kind of thought I was a jerk, to be honest. Like she showed to me, I was like, ooh, that was not my best self. Because my first words were like, you're a mystery to me. And I get frustrated with you. And like, what an awful thing to tell a 16 year old. Um, but, at, but then like the next, I was, I guess, trying to do like a tough love sort of thing. Because then I told her that I see so much potential in you. Your, your family sees so much potential in you. It's just a matter of you having your heart in the right place so you can take advantage of these opportunities. Well, years later, she's about to finish her master's degree. Um, and it took a long while to get there, but I mean, she's kept this Christmas card for 20 years, 2004. Um, and so like, what other place do you get to make that big of an impact? And I'm sorry if I get like really sort of, um, I don't know, um, macabre with this, but I always say, 
if you really want to know how amazing it is to be a teacher, go to a teacher's funeral. It's packed. It is packed. The church, the cemetery, wherever they're doing it, the room is so full because that's how many lives that person has touched with their own. Thank you very much, Dr. Diaz. We have just five minutes left, so we're going to skip to our very last question. And Natalie, that is your question. All right, so this question's for all of our panelists. So what's one piece of advice you would want our GCU students to leave today's event with as we get ready to head into the field as teachers and coaches and leaders? And Jerome, we'll start with you. The top one. Uh, the one piece of advice I, I'd probably leave is, um, it's very similar to what Dr. Diaz just said. Just, just remember the impact that you have on the lives that you serve. Um, there's, there's no greater reward. Um, there's no salary that'll ever match it. There's no um, bonus. There's no anything that'll ever match having a student call you 10 years later, five years later, 20 years later, and tell you what they're doing in their life and how that one sentence you said to them outside at recess or that one time or that, that million times that you were talking to them in the chest um, and that finally clicked with them, um, and how that's really saved their life or it's helped them be the person they are today. And so just remember that um, the impact in education is not matched by anything else really in this world. Thank you, Jerome. And Nayoka? So I guess my advice um, for first year teachers, coaches, or leaders would be to practice empathy, not only with your students and your coworkers, but yourself as well. Remember that education is a learning scale. Um, you don't come in knowing everything. You don't even leave out knowing everything. So practice empathy with yourself as well. Give your self a good hug at the end of the day and say, hey, I tried my best. I'm going to go back in tomorrow. I'm going to try a little bit harder. Um, as I said before, make sure you find yourself a mentor as soon as you get there and ask for help and learn from your mistakes. We all make them. Um, none of us know it all. None of us are going to do it all right. Asking for help can alleviate some of those mistakes and just showing the kids that you're human really, really helps the situation. Thank you, Nayoka. Rahima, could you share? Yes, I have a couple things that I want to share to those heading into the field for the very first years, teachers, coaches, and leaders. I would say to thine own self, be true. Be authentically you. Kids gravitate toward what's real uh, and authenticity. So be yourself, be goofy, be funny, be serious. Whoever you are, your best self, kids will gravitate toward that. Uh, so be authentically yourself, prepare accordingly. Um, we're in education for a reason. And so uh, prepare yourself, be the very best you can be. Um, believe in yourself. Um, opportunities present themselves to those who are ready. So believe that those doors will open, believe um, in yourself. And then lastly, it's all about service. Um, it's serving others, being the ability to put yourself on the back burner, not meaning you neglect yourself, but when you show up every day to the school, when you show up to your office in the classrooms, you're there to serve. So that's what I would leave with you. Thank you. And Dr. Diaz. Yeah, I've got a couple things, uh, if that's okay. The, the first, uh, yes, it's a calling. Yes, it's service. Yes, it's a mission, but it's also a job. And I think a lot of what's happening in our profession right now is that people are thinking this isn't a great profession because they have a really bad job. What do I mean by that? You shouldn't have to find mentors. We have mentors. You shouldn't have to spend things out of your pocket to get supplies. We have supplies. Uh, we have things that can make your job easier so that you don't focus on these things on the sides. You can focus on the one thing that you are most in control of, and that's your relationship with your student. Um, and so as you're entering as the first year, uh, be careful 
make sure that you really research the opportunities laid in front of you. Uh, I, I tell people all the time, if you go to a, an interview and they don't offer you a glass of water, or a bottle of water, well, you just learned everything about their care ethic of new people in their institution. And so for the principals on the panel, I always have water for that reason right there, right? Um, and so be, be judicious and really understanding. I have, I know who I am. I know what I'm going to bring to the table. Is this the kind of place where I can do that, where I'm going to grow? I think the Phoenix Elementary is. So the next piece of advice is to take a look at the chat. You're going to see my email. You're going to see our website. You're going to see our phone number. We have great opportunities. We're looking for great people. Because I think the other thing that I would share as advice is this is hard and it's supposed to be hard. And don't forget that. I think about uh, our great coach at Phoenix Suns who tells us everything we want is on the other side of hard. Um, and I think that gets lost a lot where we try to think about the ways we go around the challenges we're going to face as teachers. We can't do that. We have to go through them. Um, and so don't lose sight that you know pain is growth and that there is no joy without pain. The greater the challenge, the greater the celebration that's going to come at the end too. Um, and, and really grasp onto that in a world that's telling you to take the easy road, in a world that's telling you that there's, there's simpler things out there to do or that you can just numb your feelings if you play with this thing long enough. This is such a chance to ground yourself more in humanity and the struggle of being a good human and, and doing that in communities like ours in Phoenix Elementary. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much to our speakers. Such inspirational stories were shared today. Amazing advice. Um, in the chat, we can just see that you have truly moved our faculty and our students and our staff. So we thank you so, so much for your time today and sharing your stories with us. Um, very last, if you did miss uh, the, poll, the um, form that was sent out at the beginning to let us know how you learned about our event, you can go ahead and use the QR code. Um, but thank you all so very much and have a wonderful, wonderful evening.